everyone and welcome back to Law Unfiltered. I am Sonya Madison and as I told you guys earlier, I'm going to highlight certain events in the Cosby trial that started this week. And today I want to talk about Kelly Johnson's testimony. Now for those of you who don't know, Kelly Johnson is one of the witnesses that the prosecution has introduced to show, hey, Bill Cosby has a pattern of drugging women in order to assault them and we've got this witness to come and, and present what he did to her so that you can see that the victim in this case is likely telling the truth. So we've got Kelly Johnson and she is um, introducing herself as a personal assistant that used to work in Cosby's agency. And, and that during that time she was working with him that they began developing a mutual friendship. I mean, she, she again characterizes as he was really kind of looking after my career I was working in this agency and the agency was tasked with giving him work and so by virtue of those connections, he would try to talk to her about TV production, talk to her about ways to really kind of progress in her career. So she mentions there was one incident where he invited her to his, his home and she accepted the invitation and when she got there, they were supposed to be reenacting a scene where a man kisses a woman and the woman is tipsy. And she claims, you know, on the stand that, well, I never kissed him when it got to that point, but we did kind of go and, and reenact the scene. But again, she said, I, I refuse to kiss him. So the next time um, that they, they met and she continued to speak to him and even after that incident when she claimed that made her uncomfortable, he invited her to lunch and she thought, well, we're going to have lunch at a hotel. Well, it turns out he then invited her to his room and she shows up and he's in a bathrobe and slippers. So she says she proceeds to go in and he offers to give her a, a large white pill is what she describes it as. And she says that he told her it was more like an, an herbal medicine and it wasn't anything that was going to make her, I guess, unconscious or, or not you know, fully aware, but she said that, you know, it just helped you relax. So she takes the pill and she, she kind of makes it seem like, well, I don't want you guys to think that I was stupid for just taking some random pill that someone's offering me. I, in fact, wanted to just kind of put it under my tongue and then spit it out in the bathroom, but he made sure that I actually swallowed it. And then after I swallowed it, I, I then tried to run to the bathroom to throw it up, but it was too late. It was already having an effect on me. And at some point, she wakes up from feeling very out of it and sees that he is making grunting sounds behind her and her dress is lifted up. And so, uh, of course, the, na the natural thing is, is, well, did you report it? You know what happened? And she similarly says, I, I just didn't know what to do. This was a person who was a pillar in the community. I didn't think people would believe me. And he, she claims that he subsequently got her fired because, um, maybe a couple days or weeks later she was told that she would be terminated and she said she overheard him saying to another person who worked in the agency that hey i think she's trouble we don't need to continue to have her within the staff so naturally the defense comes and, and he says well first of all let's talk about the fact that you didn't report this and she, of course, goes back to the, well, he's a pillar of the community, then I lost my job. And he's like, why didn't you report it to the agency, to HR? And she says, well, they, I just don't think that they would have written it down. Now, I'm not saying that those responses are not logical, but I am saying as from the attorney standpoint, when you don't do something and say, well, it's because I speculated X would happen. Well, that's the thing, you speculate it. You still just do it, especially if you, I already felt like he terminated you anyways, then you need to then go report it. You've already lost what you felt like you was going to lose. But that's neither here nor there. So that's the one thing that the defense is also trying to take as a weakness. He also goes into her motive and he says, you know, recently I have seen you all with Gloria Allred and you're now coming forth with these accusations when other people have done so. I don't think your motive is to try to say that this thing actually happened. I think your motive is to gain more fame and more of a reputation so that you can have your name more recognizable. Now, of course, she disputes it and says, no, this actually did happen. But when you're talking about what the defense is trying to do, they're trying to cast doubt on not only the victim's story, but the prosecution's entire case. And so when they're then presenting this person as a witness to validate that, hey, this is something Cosby does. He drugs people and it's X, Y, Z. And the defense is coming out and saying, 
No, actually, because of his notoriety, you're going to have people who have seen this story play out and then use that same narrative to say, well, yes, it happened to me too, so that they can then get some notoriety. It may cast doubt on the case. But let me know what you guys think, and I will, like I said, continue to talk about some of the witnesses to take the stand and how it all ties in, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of your comments. Catch you next time on Law Filter. Unfiltered.